The year 2000 marks about two centuries since our first pioneer families accepted the challenge of the Great Forest. 200 years of facing up to that challenge has brought us to where we are today. Pickering is a bustling modern community and still growing. Everywhere you look, there are houses going up, roads improved, commercial and industrial projects on the go. There seems little left to connect us to the past, but signs often subtle remain. They exist in the landforms, in place names, in buildings of some apparent age, in solitary cemeteries, and in anonymous ruins. The message is out there for us if we attune our senses to look in the shadows. Pickering's history reaches far back beyond those first hardy immigrants. The first residents were Aboriginal peoples. Early evidence of their time in Pickering remains hidden beneath the ground. The artifacts are there, testifying to their presence. These people did not have the luxury of manufactured products like we have today. They made their tools, their weapons, out of the materials at hand, out of wood, stone, bone. and. The stone and bone are possibly all that remain to us. Um, these people live very lightly on the land. Occasionally, we stumble across one of their land, uh, one of their campsites. Recovered shards of pottery also give present-day archaeologists a way of identifying who was here and when. Each different group of people had their own particular patterns and decorations. In 1400 AD, Aboriginal people experienced a cultural change that dramatically altered their life ways. They began to cultivate what are known as the Three Sisters, or more commonly, corn, beans, and squash. Once the natives started growing corn, it changed their lives entirely. It gave them a reason to, to stay in one spot for most of the year. They would establish villages along the creeks to serve their need for water, they required well-drained soil. They required easily defensible positions because once they started being more territorial in, with their lands, they found a need to defend those lands. They lived in longhouses, homes built from wooden poles and intertwined saplings, shingled with bark. Some of these longhouses could stretch as far as 30 meters, six meters high, and were home to several families or an extended family unit. Up to 1649, Pickering was the land of the Huron tribes. The Huron of Lake Ontario's North Shore had a traditionally hostile relationship with their Iroquois cousins to the south. But with the coming of the Europeans, their occasional raids and skirmishes erupted into outright war. Ontario, then part of New France, was rich in fur-bearing mammals, especially the beaver. The trade was highly competitive among both the First Nations and the Europeans and it did not take long for deadly rivalries to spring up. That the Iroquois Confederacy was aligned with the British and the Huron with the French did not improve relations between these two native peoples. Pickering had a special significance in the middle 1600s. For centuries, native traders had traveled from Lake Ontario to the Upper Lakes by the way of a portage between the Rouge and Holland rivers. Furs moved down the carrying place from the rich trapping lands of the north Control of the Rouge Trail was vital to the French, as the trading of furs paid for the French colonial expansion in North America. These furs were a valuable commodity. They were a fashion item in Europe. The, the, it, it seems a little trite to put it in these terms, but the fact that Europeans were wearing beaver felt hats promoted the exploration of North America. At the foot of the trail lay a Seneca village named Gandatsetiegon. The Seneca, an Iroquois tribe from New York, had moved here after their people had driven the Huron out of southern Ontario around 1650. In the fall of 1669, Father Fenlon came to that village, established what is likely the first school in the Toronto area, and taught 
the Catholic religion to the natives. In 1759, Quebec fell to the British, and times changed once again. However, it is likely that, had they maintained possession of their North American colonies, the French would have settled the area beyond the St. Lawrence. Pickering's native legacy is largely hidden today. While our French era has also faded in the 200 years since settlement began, it can at least be recalled in some of the place names of the town. Three distinct examples can be seen on the map. The Bruges River, which opened up the interior to natives and settlers alike. Petticoat Creek, originally known as Petite Coat. The third example is Frenchman's Bay. Where did that name come from? Several theories have been put forth. One story is that the name came after the drowning of a number of French-Canadian lumberjacks some 200 years ago. It's also been thought to refer to Father Fenlon. Other theories for the name include the possibility of a French trading post or fort on the bay. Finally, an 1846 article in the Canadian Gazetteer said it came from a battle said to have been fought on its banks between the old French settlers and the Indians. There's no record of French settlers here though, and the name Frenchman's Bay does not appear on maps before 1820. Its true source remains a mystery. When the British saw these lands, they saw them as a place to settle their peoples. And that meant that they had to set about legally acquiring lands for settlement from the Aboriginal peoples. And the people here at that point were the Mississauga. So they were the ones who wrote the treaties. The Mississauga were not farmers like the Iroquois had been. They were still hunter-gatherers. And while they grew, they, they grew some corn, they grew some crops, but basically they were hunters and they were fishers and they moved around. And they had a different concept of land than the Iroquois did certainly a different concept than the, uh, than the British had, right? When they signed over their lands, they did not sign over the whole property forever. They essentially were saying, sure, you can use these lands. These are our lands, but you can use them too, right? You can use them for farming, sure. They didn't understand that they were signing away their rights forever. The ideal of the new imperial order was to reproduce the model of an English agricultural village from out of the wilderness. Early town lots in the colony were planned with a village square, burial grounds, places of worship, a school, a courthouse, a prison, and a poorhouse. In 1791, the baseline for what would become Pickering was laid out by Augustus Jones. Farm lots of 200 acres were established from the baseline with a road allowance at every second lot. Settlers were then encouraged to set up homesteads. One of the, well actually the first settlers that we know of, that we have any documentation for, are John and Catherine Fisher. They were here in 1799. And the reason we know that is because John died in uh, September of 1799. Now his family had come from Pennsylvania in the mid 1780s and they had settled in the area of Vaughan. But for some reason, John and Catherine came down to Pickering. The rest of the family stayed in Vaughan. But we have no idea when they came. They may have only been here for a month or two. They may have been here for a year or two. We have no way of knowing that. The traditional first settlers of Pickering were William and Margaret Peake. Uh, again, William uh, Peake, we don't know about his wife, but we know that William Peake came to Upper Canada in the 1780s. He settled first in what became York, and then later on he was convinced that he should come to Pickering, and he came to Pickering, but the earliest date we have for him is about 1800. The first settlers were faced with the task of providing shelter and food, therefore building a home and clearing the land were the first priorities. The early settlers faced an enormous amount of difference in their lives, whether they came from the United States, which was very different from Upper Canada. It was cleared, there were you know, tidy little farms and towns and villages and good roads, 
or whether they came from England. And many of them were the fourth and fifth sons and daughters of the minor gentry. So they'd been used to a very privileged life mm -hmm. um, and really weren't prepared for the life here. And it was the fact that they were uh, walking through land for days at a time to find their spot, and it was a wilderness. They had to clear trees. It took 50 years for the stumps of white pines, for example, to be pulled out. They couldn't communicate. They really lived isolated lives, of, you know, separated from each other by dense forests. Um, the cooking, the having to use the, the, the products that were available, wild fruits and, and um, plants and so on, and, and learn a very different kind of life um, making do. And also we have to remember it was not a cash economy. Mm -hmm. People didn't have any money. And the bartering and borrowing that went on is, is really an incredible part of the story. The first home was likely to be a tent or a lean-to while a log cabin was constructed. The average first log home was a humble affair. Any house greater than one story in height was taxed, so many cabins of a story and a half were used until the household could afford both a frame house and a tax rate. A fireplace would provide heating and cooking for the single-roomed homes, and often the floors were merely tamped dirt. Doors could be little more than a blanket stretched over an opening. In many ways, the lives of the earliest settlers were much the same as those of the Iroquoian agriculturalists who preceded them. Male and female roles were clearly defined in pioneer life. Well, it's my impression that quite often the actual character of the pioneer lady was, is, is often misrepresented. Um, quite a number of them had come from educated homes of culture. They had come from homes with servants to help cook and raise the children. And suddenly they found themselves in the backwoods of Upper Canada with uh, no knowledge of how to put a loaf of bread on the table or milk a cow to, to feed their children. Um, no one to help them and, and they had to just pitch in and, and muck through, quite literally, um, uh, and fend for themselves and they had to learn quickly or turn back. And uh, I don't think turning back was an option. I think society in the early days of Upper Canada was very much like it is now in, in some ways in that there were people from different classes and different life experiences. And what interests me is that we have such a rich body of literature written by these women. Um, yes, the upper class educated ones. And what you are struck by when you see some of this and read some of the literature is, is how resilient they were. They were really lost, many of them, as you said, when, when they I came so. here, but they did adapt to life and became very, very attached to this new and magnificent land. Um, and I think we are very lucky in Canada to have the kind of first-person accounts of the pioneer life of women uh, that we do have. It's, it's really a remarkable body of literature. Mary Rattan Matthews, Peter Matthews' mother, would be a perfect example of the refined woman who found herself in the backwoods. She was cultured and educated. She played the violin and wrote poetry. And uh, indeed, she is a classic example of that kind of woman. And we have a perfect example of such a woman right here in Pickering, in our own Mrs. Munger. <laughs> Upon hearing her neighbor's cry of distress, she grabbed the rifle from over the mantel and commenced to chase and shoot the largest bear ever shot in these parts as of 1805. It had escaped with Mrs. Woodruff's prize sow. Now there's a woman for you. <laughs> Indeed. You may ask, where was Mr. Munger at the time? <laughs> <laughs> Off at one of his political meetings, no, no doubt. doubt. Yes, <laughs> such was the lot of the men of those days. They, they were clearing the land, but they were also dealing with issues of more of a political nature mm -hmm. and that took them off the farm and, uh, and thus they were, the women were left with the daily chores which included uh, hitching the oxen, plowing the fields, uh, milking the cows and tending to the children and, and putting the meals on the table. Household goods were initially either handmade or imported from abroad as no local manufacturing base yet existed. Aboriginal peoples often taught the settlers which local plants could be used for medicines, dyes, and eaten to supplement their diets. While the front lots were still being cleared in the great settlement period of the 30s, those in the north had transcended the forests, evolving from simple pioneer homesteads into bustling frontier communities. Of course, beyond the material needs of the scattered residents were the spiritual ones, requiring churches and cemeteries. 
Pioneer society was strongly Christian in belief, and immigrants identified themselves as much by their religion as by their land of birth. There was not much opportunity for amusement under the harsh pioneer conditions, but the weekly visit to church allowed for visiting time and the exchange of news and advice. The first wave of settlers into Ontario, the United Empire Loyalists, tended to be of the Church of England. Also noteworthy were groups of plain folk, Quakers and Mennonites and other often breakaway religious orders. The first major settlement, that is by numbers, uh, was a settlement by uh, Timothy Rogers and his wife uh, Sarah White Rogers. Uh, they had come from the United States and they settled first in Newmarket. They were Quakers and they were the ones that established the Quaker um, a meeting house there in, in Newmarket and, and actually they were the founders of the town. Uh, he was commissioned by John Graves Simcoe to bring in four, 40 families and so he brought those 40 families into Newmarket and that was around 1800 and once uh, he had brought those 40 families in for some reason he felt I guess that he had to move on so he came down to Pickering and that was in 1807 and again he brought in quite a few families um, and they were among the earliest settlers here in Pickering and Pickering then uh, really be, w was, a, was founded by the Quakers because that was the largest uh, um, uh, number of immigrants up to that particular time. There are very few Quakers that are left here now but there, are, there certainly is a Quaker uh, meeting house even though it's been converted into another building and there's a, a friend's uh, cemetery that is across the street there in Pickering Village. So, so you can still see a remnants of the, of the Quakers uh, still here in Pickering Village. Many Americans came north in quest of cheap land. For the most part, the second wave of pioneers paid cash for their lands, and soon a series of villages thrived in the back concessions. The process took the same manner all over the township. Once the barest essentials of living were established, the next step in community's evolution was the establishment of its first industry, the water mill. Rivers and creeks of the area provided energy to run saw and grist mills so the pioneers could use more sophisticated building materials and grind their corn locally. A practical location for a mill would be at the crossing of a road and a stream. As the settlers rose above the subsistence level and had money to spend, mill sites attracted secondary industries such as smithies and cooperages. Village sites then tended to cluster about these activities and the cultural landscape began to take shape. The area's first mill was constructed by Timothy Rogers on Duffins Creek circa 1810, followed shortly by others up and down the local waterways. Farmers required access to both mills and markets and the interior of the township began to be opened up by roads. The government moved quickly to establish a self-contained colony and by 1803 Pickering was represented in municipal meetings shared with Whitby. In 1811 the first town meeting was held here and officers elected to administer the limited local powers. Those included the role of sheriff to administer law and order but most of the actual administrative authority allowed to the average citizen was limited to the writing and enforcement of local bylaws. Real democracy was not part of the imperial plan. Many residents of this new land wanted more. They had fled the oppression of Europe, and while they had not taken up arms against the king during the American Revolution, they still observed the freedoms now being enjoyed by the new republic. I think you also have to remember that the reform movement is not isolated to Pickering Township or even to Upper Canada. Uh, there were a great many influences coming to our settlers from both as far as England, uh, where there was a great re successful remor reform movement happening, um, and William Lyon Mackenzie was certainly in touch with that movement. Um, it's also true that a great number of our settlers had uh, come from the young United States. Um, they had just achieved their American War of Independence with great success, and many of those families, although they had fled the Americas, um, they came here knowing that reform was possible and the benefits that it could reap the farmer. Instead, Upper Canada was administered by a group of wealthy and influential men known as the Family Compact. Their plan was to establish a ruling class in Canada, and a friend of the Family Compact was granted privileges unavailable to the average citizen. The government was made up of a lot of rich folk. It, uh, the, the government was 
known as the Family Compact. It was a group of people that had influence and the average person, his opinion didn't mean much of anything. In Pickering, as elsewhere, the adventurous souls who were carving a nation out of the wilderness wanted their children to have every opportunity that education and ambition might earn them. They were not interested in becoming second-class citizens in this new land. Those days had passed. While the process of populating the land might seem straightforward once the surveyors had done their work, in reality things were not so simple. Fully two lots in seven were held in reserve, one for the crown and the other for the church. The sale of these properties was meant to pay for schools and churches as the community matured. But these institutions were meant for the Church of England, which left out many of those who had fled to the colonies in search of religious freedom. The family compact simply dismissed the needs of these residents. Such discontent finally resulted in violence and civil unrest, the Rebellion of 1837. The Upper Canada Rebellion sprang from many sets of roots, but for the yeoman farmers of Pickering, dissent seems to have sprung from the unfair way in which land was granted and how taxes were spent. Settlers in the back saw that the areas in the front were not being used, yet they were trying to open up their lands and it was just made completely difficult for them. Settlement duties that they had to fulfill, the building of a cabin, the cutting of a road, that wasn't being done in the center. Those who had performed their settlement duties resented the way in which many of the privileged landowners were able to avoid their share of duties and taxes, living comfortable lives in York, yet still keeping some of the best lands in Pickering. When these lands were doled out, one segment in seven was reserved for the church. Now, these are lands that would be sold to support the building of a church in that given community when the time came. But the issue was, who was going to put the road out in front of that church? If you had to cut out a load of road allowance along your lot, who was responsible for cutting out the allowance along the clergy reserve? The average settler had no interest in it. He was too busy trying to get his crops in and keep his family fed. He had no interest in cutting out, cutting out a roadway for somebody else. And again, the, uh, the very large lots that were controlled by people that lived in York, they weren't fulfilling their duties. They weren't putting in their roads. Now, this didn't matter to the people living in York, but it mattered to the people here because they needed those roads. They paid taxes. They were entitled to these things, and uh, they didn't get them. The locals saw little benefit for the money they paid the tax collector, and the needs of those in Pickering's back concessions seemed far removed from affairs at York. Another reason that I think uh, settlers in Pickering Township uh, became very much involved in the reform movement was the whole issue of religion and education. Uh, like much of the rest of Upper Canada, the majority of people in this area were not Church of England. They were Baptists, Methodists, Quakers, Mennonites, Bible Christian, and so on. And the way the government worked at that time was that, you know, tax money would be uh, spent to educate children who were Church of England or members of the Church of Scotland, the Presbyterian Church. The rest of them had to fend for themselves. And here in Pickering Township, early settlers like the Majors and Matthews had to provide their own schools for their children. And that, that became a sore point. Their tax money went elsewhere, not back to the township. Imagine then the effect of Reverend Barclay's powerful oratory as the disgruntled farmers of Pickering gathered to worship in Claremont. The disparity between rich and poor is becoming wider all the time. The existence of a power structure based upon birth, favoritism and political and religious alliances only deepens the cleavages. It offers no comfort to the landless or landed poor that a, a social organization which supports the upper class at the expense of the lower is deemed both necessary and right by the governor, by the bishop, and by leading merchants and landowners. It isn't surprising that reformers such as William Lyon Mackenzie have found an eager audience among those who've been hindered in their rise by the current social system. Oh yes indeed, brothers and sisters, discontent is widespread in the township. 
Are we to be surprised by that discontent when Lord Goderich, the colonial secretary, strongly opposes further free land grants to poor immigrants? He favours a policy of high-priced land and the prevention of its acquisition by the working class. He says, how can there be an educated wealthy elite if no one is forced to be a servant? Attempts by the Assembly and the Legislature of Upper Canada to create a, a class of landless labourers through the manipulation of land prices and then to attract capitalists to Canada to employ those labourers through the creation of high tariffs must be rejected for it threatens to bring to Canada the evils of, of class difference and class warfare which have swept through Europe. Those members of the family compact who control the banks and all capital believe that the ideal society is one in which each is content with his lot. They believe that the lower classes must bear in mind that the aristocrat's life carries with it both advantages and burdens. Heaven and its mercy forbid that the legislature of Upper Canada should inevitably conspire with rich, covetous and ambitious capitalists to reduce the Canadian population to the condition of living machinery moving for the benefit of concentrated and in many cases ill-acquired wealth. While civil unrest was not confined to Pickering, history recalls this area for its numerous rebels or, if one prefers, patriots. Lines of rebellion were drawn between neighbors and through families. Many settlers had already fled the United States in loyalty to the king. While they too were frustrated by the slow rate of progress, they were not prepared to take up arms against a system that had made them landowners, perhaps the first of their lineage, to be such. To them, rebellion was treason, and further, it encouraged invasion by the Americans who continued to regard British North America with covetous eyes. It took years to stir the impatient and indignant to rebel, but once the die was cast, events occurred quickly. Before long, people decided reluctantly that uh, the only thing they could do was take up arms against the government. The idea was to attack York, capture the weapons in the armories, capture the people in government, and set up a new government, and then turn to the people and say, now we have a new start, we need your support. But the call to arms came three days earlier than planned. The rebels were unprepared and all of their fervor could not match the soldiers and militia who came to the defense of government. A rebel detachment led by Pickering resident Peter Matthews was ordered to burn the bridge over the Don River to foil the Scarborough militia. Pickering had its own detachment of rebels or patriots and they were led by Peter Matthews of Brougham. This, uh, this was a prominent family in the community. They had been, they'd served well in the military uh, during the War of 1812. They were loyalists, United Empire loyalists. They had come here in, uh, they had come here loyal to the king. They had come from the United States. And they did not wish to become Americans. They were not, uh, they were not trying to overthrow the crown. They were trying to overthrow what they saw was a corrupt, inefficient government. Yet the best of intentions was not enough to win the day. The militia and the military were better armed than the rebels. They were better organized than the rebels and the rebellion soon fell apart. The rebels were routed and rewards placed upon the heads of the ringleaders. Lists of those arrested were published and included Pickering family names such as Barclay, Wixton, Bentley, Wilson, Lamoureux, Sherrard, and of course Matthews. Retribution came swiftly. Many who played minor roles were briefly imprisoned and paroled with an oath of allegiance to the Crown. But to some fell the ultimate payment for treason. Two men of the home district, Samuel Lount of Uxbridge and our own Peter Matthews, were hanged at York on April 12, 1838, and their remains buried in the potter's field. Pleas for clemency fell upon deaf ears, and even after his execution, the family lands were seized by the crown. 
Peter's family fled to Michigan, where descendants still live today. Peter Matthews and his story are important because the past does matter. Um, we need to have that connection with those who went before us and so that we can understand how we came to be what we are now. Uh, Pickering Township has a very rich history, and it's not just Peter Matthews. We're not trying to turn him into, myth into a mythical figure. There were many other people in this area, uh, founding families, who, who, who played a tremendous role in, in what shaped this nation, not just the township, uh, not just Upper Canada, but the entire nation. We are what we are today, partly because of ordinary people like Peter Matthews, who, because of the circumstances they found themselves in, um, ended up doing extraordinary things. Uh, there was a, a, a statement made at one time when something was being dedicated to him, I think probably a hundred years ago, that uh, it all seemed very petty and unimportant, and these were obscure men, but we need to understand that what they sacrificed helped create the great nation that Canada now is. Today, many of the communities that serve the needs of our earliest residents have faded from the landscape. But while the mills may have burned and the town sites either abandoned or absorbed into the greater community, they still exist as shadows marked by consecrated ground. The middle years of the century brought prosperous times of agriculture and industry. By the 1840s, the Pickering pioneer era was gone. The lean-tos and log cabins of earlier years had been replaced by proper homes of brick, frame and stone. The forests had been cleared to put as much land as possible under cultivation, and the hard work of early years was beginning to pay off. In less than a lifetime since Pickering was first named and surveyed, the axe and the plow had forever changed its landscape. This was also an era in which the villages began to flourish. Industries such as the cherrywood brickworks were established, and homes began to take on a more genteel aspect. The most successful hamlets tended to grow where a school lot was located near to a church and a mill site. By the middle of the century, certain villages in particular began to become more established. Pickering Village was based upon the crossing of the Kingston Road and Duffins Creek. Timothy Rogers built the first mill in Ontario County upon the shores of the creek and brought a number of Quaker families from the United States to settle here. Even so, he was not the first, as William and Margaret Peake had settled near the mouth of the creek at the end of the 1700s. Others, squatters upon the land, may have preceded them, and even before settlement was an Irish trader by the name of William Duffin, who had a post near the present-day village. Although he is said to have been mysteriously murdered in his cabin, it appears that he had left Pickering by 1778 to work on the Niagara Portage. It was said that the creek, which still bears his name, once ran so thick with salmon that one could almost walk across them. The story of his mysterious disappearance remains, however, part of the folklore of our town. During the course of its history, the village has also been known as Duffins Creek and Canton, but today it survives as a picturesque part of the town of Ajax. Whitevale, once called Majorville after its founder John Major, was also a successful mill town. But a walk up the Seton Trail reveals the remains of the old mill pond and the dam constructed to harness the flow of Duffins Creek. The hamlet of Whitevale has been specially designated as a heritage district so that it may retain its quiet air of 19th century life in spite of the rush of development around it. Greenwood was known early on as a mill town, complete with a schoolhouse which still stands today. Around the turn of this century, one schoolmaster would often bring his curly-headed four-year-old son to class. This early education must have paid off as the lad, John Diefenbaker, went on to become Prime Minister of Canada. Dunbarton, named after William Dunbar, came together for another distinct purpose. Today it is a serene backwater, still featuring some of the older buildings dating from the time Kingston Road ran through it. The Dunbar House, one of Pickering's finer, older buildings, remains today in spite of the pressures of development. Dunbarton marked the intersection of the Kingston Road with access to Frenchman's Bay. Many forget that Pickering is a waterfront community, but in the days of corduroy roads and horse-drawn carriages, the fastest, most comfortable way of travel was by sea. Frenchman's Bay offered a sheltered port, although it was prone to silting in by the lake's sands. 
Dunbar established his town site during the middle years of the 1800s and a pier at the north end of the bay to accommodate the sailing ships which ran from port to port throughout the Great Lakes. But due to silting, in 1853 a new port was built at Fairport on the east side of the bay. Trade flourished for a few years until the Grand Trunk Railroad ran a line through Pickering. The railroad simply provided better transportation, cheaper. Fairport hardly functioned as a commercial harbour from 1860 to 1875. In 1876, a better wharf, a lighthouse, and a 50,000 bushel elevator were built. Again, there was a measure of prosperity as barley and wheat were shipped out to American breweries and coal imported from the States. Wagons full of grain lined the road from Fairport to Liverpool, north of Kingston Road, but a new U.S. duty on barley and the coming of steamships put the shallow waters of the bay into a commercial decline from which it would never recover. Along with the shipping days, though, was the era of the stone hookers. Before efficient quarrying methods, stone hooking was the best way to collect building materials for the booming city of Toronto. Ships would anchor in the waters near shore and send out small scows to collect the stones and boulders using either a large rake or a winch. From the early 1800s to the 1930s, a fleet of flat-bottomed schooners plied their trade from Bronte to Oshawa. Five of the finest were based in Frenchman's Bay from the 1880s to World War I. Eventually, though, better quarries and the development of concrete replaced the stonehookers. Still, the bay had a commercial fishery, and many of those who had come to Fairport to work the docks stayed to fish. The drawing of nets was a familiar sight at the water's edge. Winter brought another economic activity to our shores. In the days before electricity, blocks of ice were used to keep food cool. The Lake Simcoe Ice Company would cut slabs of ice from the bay during the frigid months using horse-drawn ice plows and giant saws. It was then stored in seven large ice houses on shore. Ice was packed in sawdust and would remain frozen in the cork-lined buildings through the summer months. By 1915, though, the company was manufacturing its own ice and once again, the fortunes of the bay were overtaken by technology. The rail line, which had effectively shut down the port, did offer the people of Toronto a new chance to get away for a while. Our shoreline became known for its recreational activities, as Rosebank, Duffins Creek and both sides of the bay boasted resort communities. Often people just came out for the day. They disembark at Rosebank on the Rouge or at the Flag Station at St. Martin's and Bailey. From there they could travel by boat to the end of Liverpool Road where they would set up camp. The Avis property, upon which an old hotel still stands, boasted a park and a dance hall that was a well-known part of the entertainment circuit. On the west side of the bay was a cottage community known as Fairport Beach, and a little farther along, on the far banks of Petticoat Creek, was an estate known as Moorlands. Today it is the site of the Petticoat Creek Conservation Area, but around 1912 there stood a fine house belonging to businessman, author and member of parliament William Moore. The house burned during the 30s and for years the ruins were known as the castle by locals. All that remains is some overgrown stonework and ornamental shrubbery gone wild. The railroad not only affected the fortunes of the bay, it also isolated some of the northern villages. Location of station stops tended to determine the success of a community once rail replaced road and commercial importance. Some hamlets, like Thompson's Corners and Decker Hill on the Brock Road, simply disappeared. While the population of Pickering had peaked at over 8,000 by the 1860s, by the turn of the century it had once again fallen to 4,500. Aside from the villages, Pickering remained an agricultural community. The well-drained rolling landscape lent itself to market gardens and orchards, which were the mainstay of the local economy until the 1960s. Advances in technology during the early half of this century had profound effects upon everyday life. The development of electricity provided heat, light, and operated many labor-saving devices. Store-bought goods started to replace those made at home or by small local industries. At a time when Pickering was a rapidly urbanizing area, Pickering Hydro was there. From 1979, a total energy company committed to customer value and customer needs. The coming of the automobile launched another major change. 
At first a luxury for the selected few, the development of the mass assembly line turned it into an item that many a household could afford. With the car came demands for a better road system. Highway 7 was laid through the north end of town in 1922, making the rural area even more accessible, while the people of the township became more mobile. Along with the new transportation network, the telegraph began to span the province. Soon radio and the telephone made the world smaller again. The isolation of the pioneer was vanquished for good. The world became smaller still as some of our citizens went overseas and fought in the Great War, World War I. They also got through the Great Depression along with the rest of the country, but the effects were not as strongly felt because of the mix of farming done here. The coming of World War II changed the face of Pickering once again as a major munitions manufacturing center, Defense Industries Limited, was established on the eastern end of town. DIL produced bombs and artillery shells for the war effort. A neat, compact community grew around the plant to accommodate the workers and their families. DIL created an infrastructure, including water, sewers, and a steam plant for both power and heat, but at the war's end, the plant closed. With the post-war economic boom, many of the plant buildings stayed open and were used to house new factories. Many of the workforce stayed on as well, and a permanent population took up residence in the war homes and at the bay. While Pickering remained a fairly sleepy rural township, the metropolis of Toronto slowly crept towards our borders. As the area's population increased, the fields of Scarborough were being plowed under and bus and tram lines connected the east end of that township to the workplaces of the city. It was only a matter of time before Pickering's landscape began to see change again. In those years of growth, after the war, even more people were able to buy cars and the highway system was being expanded, most notably with the construction of the 401. The growth of Toronto led developers to start buying up areas of farmland in the south end of Pickering. By 1960, the lands were being subdivided for housing and residential lots replaced the acres of fields and orchards. Homes were inexpensive and attractive to those willing to commute to work. Those were the years when the Bay Ridges community pushed east from the boundaries of Fairport to Sandy Beach Road. West Shore extended piecemeal from the Bay Shore to Fairport Beach and north to the Baseline, now Bailey Street. The GO Train encouraged even more residents to settle here in the 70s. In 1974, Ontario County became the regional municipality of Durham, and the township of Pickering, with all its villages and hamlets, became simply the town of Pickering. In the process, though, the area west of the Rouge River to Port Union Road, known as West Rouge, was absorbed by Scarborough and is now part of the city of Toronto. On the east side, the village of Pickering, once the commercial core of the township, was handed over to the town of Ajax. Throughout the 70s, the south end of town was becoming increasingly more urbanized, but outside of Pickering, forces conspired that would profoundly affect the character of the rural north. In the early part of the decade, it was decided that the gently rolling countryside of the area beyond Highway 7 would be perfect for an international airport to rival Toronto International at Malton. Alongside were provincial plans to build a community just south of 7. The lands were frozen by both levels of government and property owners, some descended from the original grantees were expropriated. In shades of 1837, the local population soon mobilized and a group called People or Plains emerged to do battle against two levels of government. Armed with a mixture of highly focused protest and a smattering of guerrilla theater, People or Plains achieved a degree of victory. Both plans were finally shelved, but the lands remained in stasis under public ownership. Farmers who leased the properties were reluctant to make the kinds of investment they might with their own lands. Some communities, such as Durham, seem to languish without any apparent future. So even today, the specter of an airport has not completely gone away, but the plant community has been envisioned with more of a regard for its rural locale. Similar battles have been fought as a series of provincial governments attempted to build a mega dump site in the middle of Pickering's agricultural lands, but once again, Vigilant corps of volunteers invoked the spirit of 1837 and managed to change political and government minds, for now. At the far southeast of the town lies the largest single employer in the town of Pickering, the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station. 
This facility first commenced operation in 1974 as the world's largest reactor complex. Aside from taking over a large expanse of land, it has had a greater effect across the landscape and environment. Frenchman's Bay used to freeze over in the winter. Now the wastewaters from the plant warm the bay year-round. Fish are attracted by the warm waters and many migratory waterfowl have decided to decline the yearly trip and stay instead at the hydro marsh. Pickering Nuclear Generating Station continues to supply much of Ontario's electrical needs with a cheap and clean source of power. While Ontario Power Generation's reactors dominate much of the local shoreline, it is a vigorous partner in community initiatives such as the Waterfront Trail and successfully strives to be a good neighbour. As we stand on the verge of the next millennium, the growth of 200 years of settlement is evident all around us. Pickering has blossomed from a population of 180 in 1810 to the present estimated population of 87,300, with future projections of 122,925 by the year 2011. Pickering today covers a land area of 227 square kilometers, and while many parts still remain rural in nature, the face of Pickering has changed. Its convenient access to highways 401 and 407 and proximity to Toronto make the area ideal for industry and residential location alike. As well, Pickering offers many recreational delights for its inhabitants. There are a full range of municipal recreation programs, from aquatics and athletics to arts and crafts. The Pickering Town Centre affords people the opportunity to shop the many stores in the comfort of a bright and cheery atmosphere. There are many community and neighbourhood parks, abundant conservation areas, golf courses and beaches. A sense of community is further fostered by the many festivals and celebrations held during the year. These events express Pickering's rich diversity of people and their pride in their heritage. The future holds many exciting things in store for the residents of Pickering, providing them greater opportunities to celebrate their history. The passing of the millennium marks a dramatic change for Pickering. In reflection of its dynamic momentum, as of January 1st, 2000, the town will be known as the City of Pickering. The City is hosting the 2000 Ontario Summer Games, allowing athletes and spectators from all over the province to experience firsthand the amenities Pickering has to offer. In a new celebration of our waterfront, the Millennium Trail will span across the shoreline, providing residents and visitors alike with a walk through our cultural and natural identity. The Western Branch, the First Nations Trail, focuses upon our Aboriginal heritage and the beauty of the Rouge and Petticoat Valleys. The Eastern Branch, or Peak Trail, commemorates the period of European settlement up to today. Ranging from the Ajax border to the foot of Liverpool Road, this leg will take us from the earliest pioneers on past the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station. A third segment surrounds Frenchman's Bay. It will be called the Monarch Trail and serve to educate us on the delicate ecosystems of the bay and its environs. These scenic and interactive trails converge at the base of Liverpool Road where the Millennium Square is situated. The square and its paths serve the city of Pickering as a reminder of its rich and diverse history. It will entertain and educate people of all ages and abilities. The hope for Pickering is that we will continue to take pride in our community, that we will further go on remembering and celebrating our heritage, so that we may know where we have been and look forward to where we are going. Pickering, a complete community striving for excellence, ready for the 21st century. A vibrant community in which to live, work, and invest, where all members contribute to its optimum well-being.
comes a moment in time When you come to a river you just have to cross Or a mountain you just have to climb This is the moment and now is the time To reach out where no man has gone Time to break through the barriers, blaze a new trail. Time to reach out above and beyond. Reach for the future, let go of today. Tomorrow will bring a new dawn. Take to the challenge your own special way. When you reach out above and comes a moment in everyone's life there comes a moment in time when the future will open a whole new frontier and you reach out above and beyond reach for the future let go of today tomorrow will bring a new dawn take to the challenge your own special way you reach out above and beyond. It's a new frontier that is not in fear. There's a bright new horizon in the sky. Reach for the future, let go of today. Tomorrow will bring a new dawn. Thank <laughs> you.